Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day of this great conference. It's a pleasure to have our first speaker, Sam Graller from Arizona, who will speak on scattering scoots and gravity and electromagnetism. All right. Thank you. So if you've made it this far to a Friday morning of this conference, you definitely think post-Minkowski scattering is a good thing to do. Uh, and you think there's some very important long-term goals, or maybe fairly short-term with all the progress we've seen in terms of um, actually making useful waveforms and so on for gravitational wave astronomy. Um, I, I want to talk about some different goals, which are my personal goals, and I'd like to convince you are interesting. Uh, so the first is just saying very clearly what the question is. I think the history of general relativity has taught us that you really need to know sort of what you're calculating. Um, and it's not totally clear from the perspective of GR asymptotics, where you're really supposed to be thinking about time-like infinity, past and future, null infinity, past and future, and spatial infinity. So uh, I'm not going to present any progress on this today, but we're thinking about it. And if anything, from watching the first few days of this conference, I'm emerging from the conference reinvigorated to really try to nail this, because already we've seen discussions about BMS ambiguity and so on. And those are the exactly, exactly the types of questions we could address in a formal way uh, if we had a sort of statement in full GR with no perturbative expansion, just asymptotics, what are the observables? Then, of course, perturbative calculations, post Minkowski expansion, I just, I like analytic calculations. When you have equations that are quote unquote exact, you can really discover subtle phenomena that might evade numerical studies. Of course, numerical studies are interesting as well, but that's not what I'm going to focus on. So, we've seen incredible progress in these PM calculations up to now 4 PM, which is really remarkable from my point of view since we did 2 PM, and that was pretty hard for us. Um, but I'm going to present that today. I'm going to present work with my student, Kunal Lobo, who unfortunately will probably apply for jobs this fall. I'd like to keep him another year. Uh, but uh, where we, we redid the 2 p.m. calculation done originally by Westfall uh, using a self-force method. So my motivation for that was really to better understand self-force because I have an independent interest in that and there were questions there uh, that I thought an exact calculation of an observable would illuminate. And it did, but I'm not going to spend the talk telling you why I was confused in so forth and why I'm now less confused. I'm going to spend the talk telling you about, actually, I claim we found something new, and I claim interesting, at 2 p.m., definitely, and even at 1 p.m., okay, at the first order in, uh, where there's a gravitational interaction, uh, I claim there's something new and interesting, and we've, we've, we've named it a scoot, and the idea is you're sitting on your chair. I should, well, let's bring a chair up. It's always good to demonstrate the scoot. Oh, it's a heavy chair. You know, so sitting in your chair and you kind of go, okay, that's a scoot. What you've done is you've moved your center of mass even though you're not supposed to be able to. Okay? And um, if, you, if, you, if you want to talk about that in a relativistic way, you talk about the charge associated with the Lorentz boost, which encodes your center of mass. And if there's any change in that charge, I call it a scoot. And we actually found... And I'll explain the details something at 1 p.m. Uh, in, that, in that vein. Okay, um, any questions now? I love questions. I don't mind going a little over if we've already had our questions during it. So if you have a question, raise your hand, blurt it out. I'll repeat it so Zoom can hear, and then we'll go on. So any questions after the intro? Okay. All right, so the first thing I'd like to tell you a little bit is just how we did the calculation, just to give you a flavor of the method. Uh, there are some <laughs> new results at 2 p.m., but not much. Mostly it's very familiar to you, but maybe it'll help anchor you and, and teach a little about um, how the self-force formalism works. So, that, so the self-force idea actually goes back to Bryce DeWitt in the 60s. And so you work in some space-time, some background space-time, you know, g mu nu. And you look at the retarded Green's function. He was doing electromagnetism. I'm going to do linearized gravitational perturbations. Doesn't really matter. Um, you, so I'm leaving off, you know, tensor indices and so on, but the retarded Green's function. And what Bryce DeWitt 
worked out was that there's a Hadamard decomposition. He was sort of already studying for quantum field theory in curved space time. But for the retarded Green's function, it decomposes into a direct plus a tail. And the cartoon is if this is one space time point x, has a pass light cone, and the other space time point um, x prime for the retarded Green's function ought to be either on or in the pass light cone for causal propagation. And so the direct part is the singular piece of the Green's function on the light cone. And the tail is all the stuff inside the pass light cone. So it's a kind, you can think of it as a, um, if, it, if there was a source and you were observing it, this is all the stuff that kind of scattered off the curvature before going to your observation point. This is all the direct stuff, just goes along null geodesics like you have in flat space time. So there's a lot of you know, math in this decomposition, but then what he worked out is that if you want the force of a particle on itself, so let's call it A self. Again, I'm going to leave off tensor indices. So if you have A self, so now there's a world line, right? That is x mu of tau up there. And now what you're supposed to do, you're at some point tau, and you want to know this is a particle. You want to know the force it exerts on itself. Well, you're supposed to take a derivative of the Green's function because force is derivative of potential and so on. And you're supposed to integrate that derivative over the entire past history of the particle. So let's call this, I don't know, we used to call this world line gamma. That's a terrible gamma. It's a slightly less terrible gamma. Um, so you're supposed to do that integral along the whole past history of the derivative of this Green's function, and you're supposed to use only the tailpiece. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about this formalism, um, unless you ask questions, which is fine. Uh, but the point to, to emphasize is just sort of the regularization is already done for you. You know, Bryce DeWitt did that, and other people generalized this to gravitational perturbations, which he wasn't thinking about back then. Um, but, you know, we, we don't ever really have to think about the fact that the field of this particle is singular at the location of the particle. We just kind of go through this decomposition, we find the tail, and we do this integral. So is the G-tail really, un really un Locally it is, within a normal neighborhood where you can connect any two points by a unique geodesic. I mean, is it, do you expect it to be smooth across the uh, Well, the tail... Oh, I was supposed to do that. Yes. Is the tail really unambiguous? And I said, yes, within a normal neighborhood where unique geodesics connect two points. And then do you expect the tail to be smooth across the light cone? I think, you know, in the, in the math of this, it's been a while, but I think you, you end up writing the tail as a heavy side function, keeping the sport in the light cone times a smooth function. So it does, yeah. And, um, if you had got me a few years ago, we were really, you know, we sort of thought about the BTZ Green's function where you can really see this happen. You can see bounces off the boundary. Uh, it's pretty cool in that space time. I've totally forgotten that. Um, for today's talk, I'm going to focus on the space time of linearized Schwarzschild. So, uh, you know, basically the space time of a point particle. That's what we need for this post Minkowski calculation. Other questions, and I'll remember to repeat them. Remind me if I don't. Yes? So you don't have to regularize well, okay, if I were going to go to uh, to 3 p.m. Ah, uh, I just said that. Thank you. I knew that's why you're laughing. The question is, do you have to regularize at each order? You know, do I really avoid regularization at higher orders is the question. And, and uh, so if I were to go to 3 p.m., the next order, then I would have to do some kind of second-order self-force calculation. The way that's been formulated, um, I wrote a paper formulating that years ago. I think what they use to calculate it now is very similar. It's a little less clean. Somebody very important, myself, has taught you how to regularize <laughs> in that case, too, but it's not as simple. But actually, a separate motivation for me to go to 3 p.m., is to really do an analytic second-order self-force calculation, and I think we'll learn a lot from that. But, but good point, yes. This will work for the leading self-interaction of the particle with itself, not higher orders. Okay, ask a question so I can practice repeating it.
Yes? Is the integration and the derivative commute? Does the integration commute with this derivative? That is an extremely subtle question. Um, yes, because the derivative is projected orthogonal to the world line, I think is the answer. Self force experts might know, but if not, um, if, if it's not the very particular derivative that appears here, um, then it is, uh, there's a discontinuity uh, at the point where you're taking this derivative. This is an you know, unprimed derivative or something. And so that's why everybody else in the field has started using something called the regular field instead of the tail, because that regular field that Detweiler and Whiting introduced really is smooth. And you can just take its derivatives and commute it with whatever you want. What else? OK. So continuing with the theme of, of doing what was done in the 60s, um, DeWitt and DeWitt <laughs> later uh, evaluated this integral uh, for the space-time of linearized Schwarzschild, so a point particle. Uh, they did it for bound systems. They were mainly interested in post-Newtonian stuff. And some other people did it for scattering type systems. Westfall, in fact, who we know from the 2PM, did some of that. Not as part of the 2PM gravity calculation. But what I want to do is evaluate this integral just like DeWitt and DeWitt and Westfall uh, in the space time of linearized Schwarzschild. So I'll set g equals 1. So dt squared plus 1 minus 2m over r d, you know, vector x squared, so an isotropic coordinates. And this is the space time I want to use because this is the space time that's going to let me do the PM expansion. I'm allowed to expand in big G. So I've done that, OK? I've dropped the higher order in G terms in this metric. And so you can imagine there is either a point particle. Uh, I like to think of it as a star. There's some subtleties with thinking about it as a black hole really shouldn't matter at this order of approximation, but I don't, I don't want to get into those, so I'm going, to, I'm going to draw it as big M, and I might lapse into calling it the star. Uh, it doesn't matter. Everything at the end will be invariant under exchange of particles in the appropriate way. So it's just names, and then I'm going to have little m, and so little m is just going to move on a straight line far away. So impact parameter b. And because I'm assuming, you know, I'm basically assuming um, m over b is small. That's the post minkowski expansion. So it moves in a straight line, and it gets corrected. So I want to get the, the correction. And so there's going to be a couple of accelerations I need to worry about. So there's going to be this one, a self. So we have to do this integral. Bryce DeWitt helpfully found the analytic solution, or DeWitt and DeWitt, excuse me, uh, in this case, found the analytic solution for the tail in this special space time. It's got some nice structure. Uh, you can write it down. You do this integral over the background motion, which is just a straight line, right? Leading order approximation is straight line motion in post Minkowski scattering. And you do that integral, and you get the answer for a self, the self acceleration. And um, so let's write that up here. So a self is like some integral over grad g. And that scales like little m big m. One little m, because it is a self force, uh, I probably should have put this m here. That's the coupling. That's not in the retarded Green's function. Um, and then a big m, because the flat space time trajectory straight line doesn't have any self force. So the effect starts at order big M. Okay. And then there's another effect, which I'm going to call the recoil force. It's called, for historical reasons, the matter-mediated force. Fenning and Poisson introduced this. Not a comment anyone should care about unless you're already steeped in self force. Um, but there is an effect you have to include. As far as I know, this is the first time it's been included. You really need it in this problem. I was going to ask Barry yesterday whether he needed this in his beautiful agreement uh, with numerics. Um, but anyway, there's another physical effect that acts at this order, which is related to a Newtonian gravity, you know, how you go to the reduced mass, right? Um, but if we just imagine starting in the rest frame of the big mass 
and thinking about the small mass moving, well, the big mass feels a force due to the small mass. Right? So the big one starts moving a little bit at order little m. But then the small mass feels the new force, the perturbed force from the fact that the big one has moved. And so that's big M. And so there's this kind of recoil force, which we calculated. It's also order MM. So it's the same order as the self force. And you really, really need this to get the answer. So we count, yes. Well, we just put it in. I mean, the, the, it, so the reason it's not included in the derivation here, uh, which is really derivation has been significantly improved since Bryce Stewart's time, including uh, some work I did in my PhD thesis. The reason it's not here is you assume the background space time is vacuum. And then you're fine. If you have the background space time being non-vacuum, then there's another term here, which has to do with the interaction with matter. So that's why this is called the matter-mediated force. Um, so that's so it does have to be there, and you can derive some formal expression for it that has to be there. Then actually calculating it, all right, well, then we just treat this as a point mass. We assume it's a geodesic in, in the space-time of this one, and we, we calculate the new trajectory, and then we assume this one is a geodesic in the space-time of the moving one. We calculate that, and that's the answer we get here. Yes, I'll repeat the question this time. Non-relativistic limit. The the well, this would be, this would be related to if you wrote the Newtonian solution in the rest frame, not the reduced mass frame. So I didn't repeat it. Say it again. Correct. The recoil does not decouple. In the rest mass, if you work with the rest mass, uh, the reduced mass, so you, you usually pass to an effective one body problem, right? That, okay, thank you. But that one I didn't have to repeat because I just uh, repeated his assertion. So the, the question was does this effect decouple in the, disappear in the Newtonian limit? Or in the extreme mass ratio? In the extreme mass ratio. I don't know. Uh, um, no, I, I guess let's let's continue this discussion later. I'm sure it's there, uh, I, and I'm sure it has to do with passing to the reduced mass. Um, but I don't have a proper answer right now. Thank you, and thank you for the continued reminders to repeat the question. I do want to take care of the Zoom folks. All right, but I've spent uh, more time on the calculation than I expected. So let me, um, let me, well, we'll just keep going. I think we might go a little over the 30 minutes since we've had so much discussion during the talk. So, um, okay, very good. So we have these two terms, and then, you know, we're very, there's nothing fancy here. You know, we just solve the equations of motion, so, you know, there's, Christoffel symbols, right? Uh, these are the sort of Newtonian forces. Um, and then we have, you know, A self plus A recoil. And we just do this. We just solve these equations. <laughs> There's really nothing fancy at all here. <laughs> okay. And then we get X mu of tau. You know, at mm. That's the idea. So just a whole trajectory, you know, start to finish what this particle does. Okay. All right. So that's a kind of rest frame answer to the problem. If your if your idea is you just want to compute particle positions or whatever, um, and then we wanted to go to the center of mass frame to start comparing with calculations in the literature. For example, De Moore's calculation of the radiated angular momentum. And so the way we do that, um, this was for us the most subtle, one of the most subtle parts of the calculation was figuring out what you're supposed to do. So um, what we did was, um, so first we do the usual boost, right? We just 
this was in the rest frame. We know what special relativistic boost we're supposed to do, given the initial conditions to go into the initial um, center of mass frame. Uh, but the trouble is this technique only gave us the motion of the small particle. There's no mass ratio assumption, by the way, here. I'm just thinking of them as small and big. It can be any mass ratio. And, um, we didn't, we only, and we had the motion of this a little bit from having to deal with the recoil, but we didn't have the full motion. And so we, what we did is we just said, well, in the center of energy and momentum frame, that's why I'm calling it CEM, um, it ought to be the case that there's a symmetry of particle exchange. So we invoke the idea that exchanging one and two ought to be equivalent to rotation by 180 degrees. And I'd never seen sort of these words appear. We had to figure them out ourselves. I'd be really interested to know if, if Cha Shen, if you did something similar in the rest frame, maybe we'll discuss later. Um, but this is how we got the motion of the second particle. We, we invoked this symmetry. Okay, so that takes this trajectory. And the final output then is, and I'm going to write things really non-relativistically now, I'm just going to say we've got vector position x1 of t, vector position x2 of t in the CEM frame. And that's the output of this calculation. Okay, questions that I'll remember to repeat. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, let's compute something so you can get the scattering angle, right, by just looking, I mean, you can look literally at the angle since you have the trajectories, or you can get it from momentum transfer. Uh, but you can also get mechanical angular momentum. So, I mean, subject to all due respect with ambiguities and stuff I want to sort out later, you have a natural gauge to do the calculation in, you have the trajectories in the gauge. Let's just calculate the naive angular momentum. And so we could define delta L mechanical as, you know, just sum over one and two of, you know, R cross P. So X subscript I cross P subscript I, right? Just some trajectories you plug into this thing. So you'd have this final. So let's say T goes to plus infinity. And then we have this initially one, two, x cross p as t goes to minus infinity. You just calculate this thing, and it gives exactly, exactly what DeMore found. So we've, I don't want to take the time to write down, but this funny thing with arctanch and so on um, gives exactly the same thing, which DeMore and others have found. So we considered that a success. If it had disagreed, I wouldn't have been heartbroken because, you know, there are <laughs> ambiguities. There's get, not, you know, exactly what's observable and what isn't, isn't has not been totally sorted out in this context. Uh, but certainly the agreement made us think we're on the right track. All right, now, <laughs> five minutes, maybe we'll go five minutes over, so I have 10 minutes left. Um, well, we've had that many questions, um, then we'll have some more. So now the, the scoot. So now we wanted to think about, um, we wanted to think about not the space-space components of angular momentum, but the time-space components. Okay, so if you have an angular momentum tensor, J mu nu, we saw formulas like this yesterday from Cha Shen. I don't remember the signs. I'm not going to worry about it, or the factors of two. It's going to be something like, like this. So that's conserved in this J0i, which I'm going to call Ni, and I'm going to say mass moment. So this thing for particles is the energy, energy of the particle times the position of the particle minus the momentum of the particle times T. I'm going to call that mass moment. Got that name from Wikipedia. The Wikipedia article on this didn't exist when I first started thinking about this in grad school, but by the time I actually computed it for once, it had a name on Wikipedia. So I'm going to go with that. And so it encodes the center of mass position at t equals zero. 
and its conservation encodes the fact that the center of mass moves with uniform velocity. Okay, and we heard about this quantity from, from Chashan yesterday. So we just calculated it in the same way. You know, delta n, I'm writing mechanical to emphasize I'm ignoring everything about the fields. I'm taking my trajectories at face value and I'm writing out the change in mass moment using this formula. So again, you know, sum over particles one and two of this thing, E particle I, X particle I minus P particle I T, and now as T goes to plus infinity, minus the same thing. Let's write it out for effect. Xi minus Pi T, T goes to minus infinity. And what did we find? Delta N mechanical, I'm going to write this, this means parallel. This is the component to the right on the board. We found there is actually a change in this component and the change starts at the first post minkowskian order. So here's the formula, two gamma m m over v squared, one minus three v squared log m plus gamma little m over little m plus gamma big M. And there was 2 p.m., which we also calculated, but I'm not going to show that for now. And there was also a delta N mech perpendicular, and that was 2 p.m. We calculated it. I'm not going to show that now. So this was a big surprise to us. And, you know, when we derived this, we were not ready to just write the paper, upload it, and say, okay, all done. There's a scoot at first post Minkowskian order. We had to understand this in some way. Um, I think the 2 p.m. stuff is also interesting. It partially agrees with the radiated stuff Chashen found, but not entirely. But in any case, this log thing, this 1 p.m. log, definitely doesn't appear in the radiated mass moment. There's no radiation at all at 1 p.m. Okay. So there's something funny going on here that I'm claiming the particles have, in effect, scooted forward in their chair. <laughs> so to speak, uh, but where did that mass moment go? It didn't get radiated off to infinity. There's no radiation. The fields fall off like 1 over r squared and so on. So this is, this is the puzzle. Let me see if anyone wants to ask a question now that I will repeat. Yes. Okay, so the question is, do we take p to infinity and then plug it into this formula, or do we keep the 1 over r corrections to p and e and so on, and then do this whole thing? And the answer is, we absolutely have to keep the 1 over r corrections to be sure. But interestingly, it turns out you don't have to. Um, and we comment on this in the paper because it's another reason that you really better consider the mass moment entirely. If you leave this off and say, well, I want center of mass, I really want E times position, then the one over R corrections change the answer. And that's very confusing. It's like you're not really in the asymptotically flat region. Um, so, yeah, I repeated it. Any other questions? Got one minute left officially. Yes? This scoot is part of the angular moment of tensor, right? Yes. So does this mean that there's also angular moment of loss at 1 p.m. if I change the frame? Uh, well, there's no center of mass frame angular momentum change. So the same different statement that you say that at 1 p.m. there is no angular moment of loss. So the question is about 1 p.m. angular momentum loss. I'm saying at 1 p.m. there's no angular momentum loss, no I, ij components of angular momentum in the center of energy frame. Yeah, in the center of momentum state. So, but there is mixing of components if I go to I don't think this component mixes the parallel component because the boost is parallel. Yeah. Okay, I'll take five minutes with this, with the chair's permission. 
um, to show you our proposed understanding of this. So we went to an electromagnetic analog. So our suspicion is that what's going on here, since there's no radiation, is that there's some weird exchange of energy between mechanical and field degrees of freedom that's somehow non-radiative. Okay, this happens all the time. Just think about two-point particles. You let them go. They fall towards each other. You learned a long time ago that there's potential and kinetic energy being exchanged, right? Well, what's the potential energy, fundamentally? Where is it carried? What is this thing? It's in the, in the electromagnetic field. Okay, nobody derives it this way for you in freshman physics or whatever, but you do the integral of the electromagnetic stress energy tensor for these two particles, keeping just the cross term, which is the interaction piece, you find exactly the potential energy. So that's what we thought was going on, something like that, but in gravity, that's very hard to make precise because there is no local energy density of the gravitational field. Okay, so that's why we went to the electromagnetic analog. So this is a second shorter paper we wrote on this. And the story is exactly the same. So we just did it at 1 p.m. analog order. So we found the same delta n mech parallel with a slightly different prefactor, minus 2 q1 q2 over gamma squared m squared. Same log thing, m2 plus gamma m. 1 over m1 plus gamma m2. Different prefactors, same effect. Okay. Now, one nice thing about the NM is I can do a lot better on what I mean by center of energy and momentum frame. Okay. So we really did work in the CEM frame. And the CEM frame is defined by the conditions that P total is 0 and n, the 0i component, total is 0. Okay, and we derived, we calculated, we proved, whatever you want, this is a simple thing you can do, that this is true, okay, in the frame where we got this answer. So, yes? Total field, particles, particles and field, yes. So the question was total meaning particles and field, and the answer was yes. So n total equals, you know, n1, mechanical from 1, and two mechanical from two and electromagnetic and you just do the cross term. Okay. And so to show this, of course, we had to actually calculate this integral. There's really no substitution. We had to evaluate the electromagnetic integral. And what I can show you in the last couple minutes is, is what happens. So let me show you early times. T goes to minus infinity. Let me show you what things look like. So let me give you the mechanical part. So this, the sum of these is what I mean by mech. Put a bigger chalk here. Let's not make it a vector. I, I can, well, yeah, let me give you the directions so you can see how the symmetry is broken. Okay, so the mechanical thing, again, just by computing this. Now at early times, the mechanical thing is exactly this factor here without the 2, m squared log of all that stuff. So that's at early times. So it was it's a little strange, right? We thought we we're in the center of energy momentum frame, but the mechanical mass moment is, is not 0. But actually, you do the E and M integral. It's, it's some integral we actually had to do. And you get the same thing with a minus sign. What does that say m squared? That doesn't, yeah, it should be v. m1 and m2 are in here. And so they exactly cancel. And so you have this situation where you really are in the center of energy momentum frame. There's no mass moment, but at arbitrary early times, there's equal and opposite contributions from the particles from the electromagnetic field. Okay, so if I said this happened at it, it, it intermediate times in the scattering region, no one would be at all concerned, right? That's like exchange of kinetic and potential energy. If you look at how much energy is in the particles versus how much energy is in the field, that's just kinetic and potential energy. Of course, when they're close together, there's some of each, right? 
The thing about potential energy is when the particles are infinitely far apart, the potential energy goes to zero. Okay, but when the particles are infinitely far apart, the analog mass moment does not go to zero. It goes to finite. <laughs> so as a last comment to help you understand this, I, I think there's two little, and then we'll go to questions, I think there's two little things to keep in mind. So if a force goes like 1 over r squared, then the velocity goes like 1 over r, and the position goes like log. So this is one very, this is where these logs come from. So you have a long range force, electromagnetism, your position is always logarithmically divergent. And the logs don't quite cancel and that gives you this. And then that's sort of to understand the mechanical thing and to understand the electromagnetic thing, just think about potential energy is like Q1, Q2 over the distance. But mass moment ought to be vaguely energy times distance sort of what it is. So if you sort of accepted there was a kind of potential energy like this, then the mass moment is going to be order one. And I'll uh, stop there and take any more questions. Thanks a lot. Please. So when the two masses are equal, this extra 1 p.m. term vanishes. Right, by symmetry. I think so. Okay. That's one sanity check for it, yeah. Touching? Um, I think I missed the final punchline. So you said that D go to the, in the past, you have this mechanical and EM. And what happened in the future in the EM? Same case? thing, they both switch sign. Yeah, I didn't quite get to the punchline. So if I wanted to go, T goes to plus or minus infinity. Then I put a plus or minus here. And I put a minus plus here. And I maybe I can find room to draw a plot of what actually happens in the scattering process. It's a little small, but I think that's better than erasing. So the time goes to the right now. This is really pre-relativity stuff. Uh, and so let's plot the initial values of n mechanical and n electromagnetic. They're equal and opposite. And you know you can calculate everything in this example. This is all derived. Uh, you just plot it. What happens is it comes down at the moment of time symmetry. It's zero, it's they're equal at zero, and they switch. So none of this has anything to do with radiation. It's just initially there was the zero mechanical, the zero total mass moment had some amount in E and M, some amount in mechanical, and at the end they switched. So can I follow up on the question? So it's, but it seems like the E and M field, the mass moment does change after scattering. Yes. And I was thinking that that's radiation. <laughs> that's what. Uh, well, you know, you can argue a lot over what's radiation, but... Or at least the field, the content in the field changes after... Um, so is any permanent change in the electromagnetic field content supposed to be due to radiation? I don't know. I mean, I think that's, we're kind of used to thinking about that. Um, I, I, I'm not worried about relating to the clear fact that there's no radiation. I mean, I think it has, goes back to point one, that we really have to think about um, the meaning of these things in asymptotics, but at face value. Yeah, thank you. Uh, quick question. You said x goes like log r. What's it, the, the scale of that log? Like, there has to be some other spatial scale inside of the log. So in your calculation, uh, what, is, what is the other scale? I mean, yeah, if you work out the trajectory, I mean, there's impact parameter, for example. Uh, that that certainly appears. I I could uh, I don't have my computer. But it's fixed. It's the, you don't get it to choose what the what the other scale is. I guess that's no. The, I mean this is really you know you could have a high school student an advanced high school student do this calculation. There's no renormalization, no scales, no nothing. You just solve the equations, and the log appears. I mean we have to choose initial conditions and so on for our differential equations or their integrals. We have to choose the plus C, but you know, we do that 
fit for physics reasons, you know, to make sure we're in the center of mass frame and so on, and we set the origin at a convenient place, there's just no freedom. But I guess if you shift x, you can always absorb it in that scale of the log. If you, if you shift your initial condition, you can always just say... You, uh, could, you could change what the log looked like by changing your origin, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that should be viewed as initial conditions. I mean, the thing is that, that I haven't thought about scattering very much, but the surprise to me was these particles really aren't free in a sense. Even at early times, they're still interacting. There's this divergent position. And so I think that's the, you can't get rid of the divergence. And I'm sure you can't, you could change the value here, but you certainly can't change the change in mass moment. Yeah, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, I guess the first thing I just wanted to comment that at maybe at first glance, it looks weird that you, you know, don't get radiation, but you've rearranged the fields. But you literally took the sources of the fields and you rearranged them. So it should not be shocking that the field configuration can be changed radically, not necessarily even having any emission, because I just picked up the particles, I moved them around, the fields have changed. Um, my question was going to be, this seems to indicate that focusing on just the properties of the particles is missing all of the, st half the story, uh, and so mm -hmm. when we now look forward to gravitational calculations, Right? Uh, I mean, as you pointed out, it's not so obvious how we define the field content in gravity. But, I mean, is there some step happening in scattering calculations where this field contribution is being ignored in some sense or being put aside? Well, in my calculations, yes, for sure. And, when, mean, and when and how? Or, and could you restore it? Uh, I don't know if we could restore it. We tried. I mean, yes, I'm sure we can eventually getting back to point one. I think it may really have to do with, you probably want to think about time like infinity, not t equals constant slices. That's my hunch, and we have some preliminary stuff suggesting that. But in terms of pursuing this kind of explanation, you know, in E&M, you're definitely allowed to think about t equals constant slices. <laughs> um, you know, the problem with doing, doing that in GR is you don't have your t EM, I didn't even write it down. You know, what is this integral? You know, you have integrals of T, EM, you know, mu nu, killing field mu, normal vector nu, you know, D3X or something. And, you know, this object just doesn't exist in gravity. Just, I mean, you could try a pseudo tensor like Chashim was talking about, and we tried that, and we got the wrong answer by 7 eighths. And then we looked at some papers I think you were on with, with Maybe with with uh, some of the old Caltech momentum field line stuff, sure. and that seven eighths appears there too. And we're like, this is total nonsense. I'm never doing pseudo tensors again unless it's for gravitational waves, which is what Sha Shen did. And so it, it, this explanation makes me convinced that the calculation of the log in the gravitational case is not a mistake. Like we definitely got it, but it also makes me think that this framework is not right for gravity. We need something different. For the record, the pseudo tensor stuff was one paper before my time. Oh, so okay. I came, I came in you just after the pseudo tensors were abandoned. <laughs> uh, they're, yeah. Okay, thanks. Just one question from my side. Why is delta n anti-symmetric when you swap one and two? Um, let's let's get the vector. Let's get the vectors in there. So. Ah, okay. okay. R from one to two at early times. So if this is, you know, so this is r hat one, two, if this is one, and this is two at early times. So if you swap the particles, the yeah. mass moment will swap. So you just, does that answer it? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Last question. So, are these scoots uh, observable? Well, in uh, electromagnetism, certainly. You can measure anything you want in electromagnetism. You can measure the particles and you, positions, and you can choose to calculate. Uh, where's the definition? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can choose to calculate this. Um, so it's some little, everything's observable, you could say. What, and the same is true in gravity, you can always measure the Riemann tensor, right? Um, so yes and no, I think I can translate your question as to why is this interesting. And just, I think, you know, 
history of physics has taught us, you know, to think about all the conserved charges associated with all of the symmetries or asymptotic symmetries in the problem. And so it's a, just a puzzle we think we need to understand to make sure we're not missing something important in the scattering framework. All right, time's at the end. Let's thank Sam for a very nice presentation.